if he starts speaking, there will be an absolute <laughs> No, uh, uh, just uh, for those who would be inspired by this lecture, tomorrow at 10 o'clock, there will be an, an, an informal meeting with throughout the, 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 the Department of, uh, of Philosophy. 10 o'clock, uh, whoever uh, is there will be interested in, uh, in speaking personally with Kaufmann, please. No. Uh, no, I think uh, this 1999 uh, Stuart Kaufmann was, was here and gave a, a lecture at an occasion because he was invited uh, to Prague uh, by, by this man. In, uh, this, uh, this is Karl Pribram, a uh, famous, uh, famous uh, neurophysiologist and brain physicist and whatever. And uh, he, he got a uh, uh, Vision 97 award for from Václav Havel. And he invited to, uh, to uh, hear the discussion panel here and, uh, uh, and Stuart was, uh, was invited. So you, you have some uh, you have some, uh, some uh, copies of yourself seven uh, <laughs> years ago. Nice that. So these are just uh, just pictures from that made uh, made by Anna Becker. You know the blackboard was green. And now. Uh, if I if I if I have to introduce Stuart, I, I think his career uh, can be divided into three etapes. First was his, uh, his stru uh, biological structuralism etap, I would call it when you start, uh, when you when you did embryology, when you start, when you work with uh, with uh, Brian Goodwin, and uh, and uh, this uh, uh, this etap was uh, culminated uh, with uh, his book The Origins of Order. Very thick book, <laughs> and uh, so there are some uh, some ideas I I think uh, I, I, I think uh, are just uh, just some outcries from him. Hey, has historical universals uh, will will rule uh, rule morphogenesis of of, uh, of uh, living being? Morphology is a marriage of underlying laws and the agency of selection. So this laws uh, that the idea of biological structuralism. Uh, coming back to, uh, to organic forms uh, from 18th and early, early 19th century. Okay. Then he, uh, he asked uh, what, uh, what the fitness of the landscapes must, must, uh, uh, must look like if, uh, if uh, mutational selections, we know it, can work. And he, he, says, uh, he says a different, uh, he, uh, he shows different, uh, different fitness landscapes uh, and then he worked with the direct uh, fitness landscape and with co complexity catastrophe. And uh, what is nice, uh, crystallization of life is, uh, is a very uh, a very nice idea that comes from, from this book with the, the subtitle of one cha chapter. And then, uh, then the, the rest of the book is just genetic regulatory circuits and stress shows that, uh, that living beings, uh, this, this very complicated networks of interactions, living beings is just, uh, just walking on the edge between the absolute chaos and, and uh, absolute, uh, absolute frozen state. And so, uh, so uh, really, uh, really, I, I like it very much, of course. It's very so I read the book, but anyway, uh, I, still have, I still have my notes. The second is, uh, is investigations that appeared in 2000. Uh, and uh, we have, uh, we have the, the Czech translation of this book on the name of uh, Schmidt-Isaac on the fourth law, because, uh, because the fourth law of thermodynamics is, uh, is the leading, uh, leading theme of the, uh, of the book. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, you may, yeah, those, who, those who attended my courses, uh, so you know, much of the order of organisms, I believe, is self-organized and spontaneous. To the name for self organization, mingles with natural selection, barely understood ways, we have the magnificence of our TV biosphere. And now that you have this, uh, this dialectics of autonomous agents, that is, human beings, and biosphere, where, uh, where the adjacent possible is uh, being negotiated. So, negotiation of the adjacent possible is, uh, is a very, uh, very important term of this, of this book. 
And uh, then uh, Stuart Kahn asked, if there cannot be general laws of all open thermodynamic systems, might there be general laws for thermodynamic open but self constructing systems, such as biospheres? And uh, I believe that the answer is yes. And uh, so, uh, so the eighth chapter, the eighth, chap eighth chapter of this book, is uh, really an essence of uh, theoretical biology in this way. Uh, and uh, and the answer of propagating orientation, what evolution is as a propagating orientation. So I, of course, I can speak only briefly because, uh, because it's not my lecture. But no, uh, this, uh, this is the book from uh, this year. I'm sorry, I haven't read it yet. Uh, I don't have it in. So, uh, so uh, uh, yeah, I know this maybe the, the third phase of your development, if you are going to speak about it. I I was just in Budapest, and um, uh, Aaron, Aaron, who's four years old, has a bad cold. So my voice stopped this morning, and it's sweet little Aaron's fault. Okay, so I, I hope that we can get a, a microphone. So, uh, and can you hear me in the back anyway, kind of, a little bit? It's the best I can do. I'm terribly sorry. I think that it will come and go. I was praying on the airplane. And, you know, maybe God exists and will help. This is a good chance for me to thank Anton. Um, Anton translated my, my third book into Czech. And it's on my shelf at home. And I think, my God, I've got a book in Czech. So thank you, Anton. Um, this is very frustrating. And I can't do much about it, as I've said. Also, I've got a bad back, so I have to sit down. Or you can just leave. <laughs> Um, so, forgive everything. I, I hope that I can try to explain all of this to you. So, in the third phase of my life, this is actually funny. <laughs> in the third phase of my life, <clears throat> I'm thinking about two huge issues. Are there any laws that entail the becoming of the biosphere? I think the answer to that is no. That's not this talk, but it, it's an interesting talk. Um, what I've gotten interested in the last seven or eight years is the famous mind-body problem. You know, how, what's consciousness? The first thing to say is that nobody knows. I have my own speculations, and I'll, of course, tell you them. <clears throat> I think most of what I will say today is correct. Some of it is pure speculation. A fair amount is testable. Some of it's not. But nobody knows what the mind-body problem is has as its answer, so we just have to think. But I do think, and I hope I persuade you, that we must think about quantum mechanics. Uh, I hope at least I persuade you of that. What just happened? <laughs> Good grief. Okay, let's start with Descartes and Ray's Cogitan and Ray's Extensa. Ah, it's 1640. And Descartes says, M the mind consists in res cogitans, thinking stuff. And the world consists in the mechanical worldview, res extensa. I think you all know that. And even at the time, the Queen of Sweden said, but René, how does res cogitan act on res extensa? That problem becomes acute with Newton. So this will be central to us. You all know Newton's three laws of motion, first, second, and third, of course, and universal gravitation. 
Newton invents differential and integral calculus, and we get classical physics. That's point two. Do you know the word stalemate? It's being blocked, irretrievably blocked. By the way, this is my first chance to talk since Trump was elected. Horrible. Okay, I've said it. Okay. Uh, the stalemate. Here's the problem. Think of billiard balls on a table. I've got seven, seven billiard balls and they're rolling on a table. If I know the initial conditions of momentum, uh, uh, of momentum and position, and I know the boundary conditions of the table, the behavior of the system is entirely deterministic, yes? Namely, if I ask Newton, what should I do? He, I'm sorry my voice keeps doing this, but I, I hope you can understand. Newton would say, uh, what's going to happen? Newton would say, write down my equations in differential form. You know the initial and boundary conditions. Integrate my equations. You'll get the trajectories of the balls. What is it to integrate Newton's equations? It is to deduce, to deduce the consequences of the differential equations for the trajectories. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. That's logical entailment. Newton's laws logically entail the trajectories by integrating his equations. And that leads to this stalemate. Because if you think the brain, and most neurobiologists do, is a classical physics system, then there is nothing for mind to do and no way for mind to do it. Is mind somehow supposed to make the billiard balls move differently on the table? Can you hear the problem? So this is the stalemate. We've been stuck here since Descartes, uh, since 1640. I actually think I know an answer to Descartes. I hope I can persuade you of it. But given this stalemate, let's ask the question, could a classical physics mind be conscious? Of course it could. But it could only look at the world. It couldn't change the world. There's no way for this mind to change the deterministic behavior of the classical physics system. So it would be a purely epiphenomenal mind. It could witness the world. It couldn't change it. Why, why do we have such a big brain that uses so much energy? What's the selective advantage of a brain that can't change how we chase rabbits or foxes or, or whatever? No, this is all well known. I think we're frozen in it. and We've been frozen since Descartes and Newton. But there's something else that's important. Um, do not be too sophisticated. Do all or most of you believe that the following claim is true? You could decide to sit here now and listen to my broken voice. Or you could say, this is terrible. I'm getting up and walking out of the room right now. Most of us think that's true. If it is true, it's a counterfactual statement. You can't both be in here a minute from now and out the room. But for that counterfactual statement to be true, it must be possible for the present to be different. You're outside the room or you're sitting in here listening to my broken voice. Classical physics does not support counterfactual statements, a statement contrary to fact. You can't get it out of classical physics. This is as big a problem as determinism. And that's point four. Um, that is to say, in classical physics, given the initial and the boundary conditions, all that can happen is what actually happens. That's it. There, there's no response given the causal closure of classical physics, which everybody assumes, but we don't really know that it's true. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm pressing something. In order to break the causal closure of classical physics, the way is to think about quantum mechanics. I'm sorry in the back that it's hard for me to stand up. I'll do it for a minute to prove that I'm here. Okay. I just have a sore back. Uh, so we're going to break the causal closure of classical physics with quantum mechanics. 
Most of you know this, but not all of you do. If you'd have asked a physicist 10 years ago, could quantum mechanics have anything to do with biology? The answer would have been, of course not. In a warm, wet environment, the system will decohere in a femtosecond. I'll explain decoherence shortly. But about eight years ago, it was discovered that the light harvesting molecule is quantum coherent a thousand times longer than anybody thought for a nanosecond rather than a femtosecond. I'll, I'll tell you more about it later. At this stage, we have to say that quantum mechanics has something real to do with biology. It's how light harvesting molecules are 90% efficient, not 30% efficient, because of superpositions and parallel search for the reaction center. We do not know how far quantum mechanics goes in biology. My own guess is that it goes a long way, and I'll try to persuade you of that later, but we don't know. Okay, um, that's point six. Do you all know the two-slit experiment? Those who do not know the two-slit experiment, please raise your hand. So I'll say it fast. Um, I, I need to show those of you who don't know the central ideas of quantum mechanics. So here's the experiment. I have a, a screen with two narrow slits cut in it. I cover one with a piece of wood. I shine a flashlight at the open slit and the light falls on a, on a film emulsion behind it and I develop the film emulsion. I get, if it's a negative, I get the, a dark spot or if it turns it positive, a light spot behind the open slit. If I change it so that the left slit is open rather than the right, I change where I get the bright spot. That's what you'd expect on classical physics. The mystery is that if you open both slits, you get a light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, light, dark pattern on the film emulsion called an interference pattern. That can't be explained classically. Richard Feynman rightly says the central mystery of quantum mechanics is right here. For those of you not used to it, um, think of water waves propagating towards a beach. Now think of a wall between where the water waves are coming from and the beach. And think of two uh, slits in the wall. Think of the water going through the two slits. On the beach side of each slit, you'll get a semicircular wave propagating towards the beach. So you get two semicircular waves, and now just one wave each. Walk along the beach, and if the two semicircular waves cross one another, make it a succession, a train of waves, so they're all concentric circles. Then on the beach, as you walk along the beach, there will be points on the beach where the crest of one wave hits at the same spot as the crest of another wave. You'll get a higher crest. That corresponds to a light spot. Or the trough of a wave, the bottom of a wave, hits at the same spot that the trough of another wave hits. You get another light spot. But at some points between them on the beach, the crest of one wave will hit where the, the trough of the other wave hits, and they'll cancel. You get a dark spot. That's the interference pattern, and that's, that's how Schrodinger's wave equation works. So it's a linear wave equation. The amazing thing is that nobody knows what's waving. The equation was written down in 1927, and it's 90 years since then. Nobody has any idea whatsoever what's waving, given all of quantum mechanics. Uh, I have some ideas, but I don't believe them. Actually, I do, but that, that, that doesn't matter. Um, okay. Um, now, uh, eight. Uh, von Neumann, uh, I just got to be in Budapest, I can say he's, he's Hungarian, but he's almost Czech. In 1933, he publishes the, the Grundlagen der Quantenmechanik, or something like that. And it is at least a standard interpretation of quantum mechanics. He describes two processes, the propagation of the Schrodinger equation, which is completely deterministic, and then something magical called measurement. So process one is measurement, process two is this deterministic propagation of the Schrodinger wave. To use an American expression, nobody knows what the hell measurement is. Ninety years later, 
but getting the spot on the, on the film emulsion is measurement. And this leads to extraordinarily weird statements. Uh, I'm on point nine. Uh, counterfactuals which are, are an ontological requirement for free will. I don't know how to get free will, but I know how to get nine. Nine comes out of the Schrodinger equation. It supports counterfactual statements. And the way that it's normally said means we have to talk about superpositions. A quantum spin can be up or down, or this way and this way. And what one says, and this is one of the strangenesses, it's, it's utterly weird. Quantum mechanics is weird. That means strange. Is that you can have two, two photons Two, two electrons, say, and it's called entangled. That means that you cannot write the wave function of one electron separately from the other one. There's a single wave function for the two. By symmetry, if one is up, the other is down. Among the magical things is there's no state of the spin until it's measured. None. There's no state of the matter until it's measured. But this following statement is also true on almost all interpretations of quantum mechanics, not Bohm's. If spin one is measured, it might be measured to be up, but it might be measured to be down. And it's ontologically indeterminate, not epistemologically, ontologically. Then the present can have been different. The spin can be found to be up, or it can be found to be down. So we have nine. Counterfactuals are perfectly legitimate in quantum mechanics. This doesn't tell us what free will is. It tells us that standard physics gives us the logically necessary conditions, this is philosophy, I guess, for free will. So that's nine. And 10 is, before measurement, there's no state of the spin. It's neither up nor down. It's just, and at measurement, it becomes something. What I actually think is that, it, and it's, it's a long talk. It's in my it's in my last book. So if you buy a copy of it, I'll make ten cents. So if you all buy it, I'll make enough for dinner in the United States. Um, I actually think what's going on is the following. I think this is a good proposal. A super. I think quantum mechanics is about ontologically real possibilities, and it's a long conversation. And I can show you that it explains a phenomenon called non-locality which I can describe briefly to you. Um, and you might want to go look at that, but I can't really talk about it in the hour that I've got, um, except that I like it. Uh, so, uh, so here's a null measurement. Um, superposition is that the spin is up or down. Um, now, if you read a book called The Quantum Enigma, one can do the following experiment. You can prepare an electron in a superposition simultaneously in box one and in box two. Now you perform a measurement. You open box one, and fundamentally you look and see if it's in box one. If it is, it's been measured in box one, and it comes to exist in box one. Standard quantum mechanics. But if it's not in box one, it comes to be in box two, despite the fact that nobody looked in box two. That's a null measurement. They work. And if you read Roger Penrose's book, The Road to Reality, there's a null measurement that's been done on something called a bomb experiment, where there's an actual physical consequence of a null measurement. This breaks the actualism of classical physics experimentally. We have what we need for the logical requirements for free will. Not yet free will, the logical requirements for free will. Okay. That, so I'm on 12. <clears throat> I now want to seriously, without bringing up my ontologically real possibles, which I call res potentia and res extensa, linked by measurement. I guess I can say what I mean very briefly. Um, Aristotle's law of the excluded, this isn't up there, Aristotle's law of the excluded middle is the following. The cat is on the table. That's true or false. 
the statement the cat is on the table and simultaneously not on the table is a contradiction. Quantum mechanics requires the following. Before measurement, the cat is simultaneously on the table and simultaneously not on the table. That's what superposition does. It's the linearity of the Schrodinger equation. Nobody knows what to make of it. So I'm going to suggest something. The philosopher C.S. Peirce says, rightly, actuals obey Aristotle's law of the excluded middle. I'm going to define an actual as something that obeys Aristotle's law of the excluded middle. Then he says, possibles do not obey Aristotle's law of the excluded middle. And here's the proof. The cat is possibly on the table, and simultaneously it's possibly not on the table. Is there a contradiction? No. Right? Do you feel it? Can you see it? That's it. So the move I make is to say possibilities are ontologically real. And I like it a lot, and if we have more time, I'll talk about it. Okay. Now, leaving out Ray's potential, I want to try to answer Descartes. If this is right, it's important. Nobody's answered Descartes since 1640. So I'm really going to try, and I actually think there's a good chance I'm right. Um, we're going to break the causal closure of classical physics, but quantum mechanics does that. So the next thing to tell you is there is no known mechanism for measurement. None. People have been trying since 1927 to get a deductive mechanism for the outcome of measurement. Nothing. By the way, I will prove a very simple theorem. If, if Ray's potential is right and Ray's extension is right, and if they're linked by measurement, there can be no deductive mechanism for measurement for a very simple theorem, and here it is. Ray's potential is about possibles. X is possible does not logically entail X is actual, right? So if you buy Ray's potential, there can be no deductive mechanism for measurement, and it's easy to disprove it. Find a deductive mechanism for measurement, and I'm wrong. And somebody might. Nobody has period, but they might. Okay, so 14 is, I'm going to tell you that there's no deductive mechanism for measurement. Meanwhile, there's a theorem, the strong free will theorem by Conway and Cochin, C-O-N-W-A-Y, K-O-C-H-E-N. <coughs> basically, oh, good grief. It's a proof that if you are capable of quantum random irresponsible behavior, a physicist, then the following three claims are, are true. You have to read the theorem. Nothing in the past of the universe determines whether an electron will be spin up or spin down. There is no mechanism for measurement. And then something stunning. The electron free will decides. That's why I call the strong free will theorem. Go read it. It's the only theorem that I know in mathematics or physics that uses the experiential term free will. Freely, and it decides non-randomly, which would require breaking the Born rule. And the Born rule has only been, t that's the, the probability of an outcome is the square of the amplitude. It turns out the Born rule has only been tested experimentally to two decimal places. It's barely tested. So everybody thinks it's true, but maybe it's not. We don't know. I'm not claiming anything one way or another. Okay. Now I'm going to tell you about something completely different. It's called the Poise realm. So it'll take a few while, a few minutes to explain this to you. Um, this, this started to happen around 2010. I was uh, in, in Budapest. I was in, in Finland and in Budapest. And I was with my friend Gabor Vate yesterday. He's at Utfush. And Gabor and I and a friend, Samuel Niranen, either discovered or invented or lied about the Poise realm. So let me tell you decoherence. It's perfectly established. Decoherence is the following. I've got these quantum waves that we talked about. And if you take a closed quantum system, it cannot lose phase information, period. It's always, it's always unitary, namely the sum of the squares of the amplitudes add up to one. About 20 years ago, Wojtek Zurich and others started thinking about a quantum system that you open to the quantum environment. 
And the quantum system interacts with the quantum environment. And the heights of the waves at every point in space in the Schrodinger equation are given by an action variable that rotates in, in time and space. It's called phase information. Think of the water waves. They've got height everywhere. The phase information is just lost to the universe. But it's not lost causally. It's totally a-causal. The consequence of that is that the interference patterns disappear. And they do disappear. They completely disappear. And you get the two bright spots behind the two slits. You don't get an interference pattern. Decurrence is absolutely cleanly established. Uh, a physicist in Vienna has done it with Buckmeister fullerenes, buckyballs, which are 60 carbon atoms. You can get interference between Buckmeister fullerenes, and you can get decoherence. Several years ago, Gabor and I and others started thinking, could you get recoherence, where you get coherence again? The answer is you can. There's a theorem due to Peter Short that says, if you inject information to a decohering variable, like a quantum qubit, while it's decohering, you can make it coherent again. I call that recoherence. I don't know what other people call it, but let's call it quantum recoherence. In theory, it's completely established. There's pretty good evidence that it's true experimentally. It turns out that the, 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 that, uh, the chlorophyll uh, thing that does the light harvesting is sitting in a protein called the antenna protein. And there's quite good, but I think not yet absolutely certain evidence that sound vibrations, called quantum mechanically phonons, drive recoherence of a decohering electron and exciton. Almost certainly, it's proven experimentally. So one axis of the poison from your point of view is a y-axis that goes from quantum coherent up to classical by decoherence. It's really classical for all practical purposes. That means that the off diagonals in the density matrix go to zero. But by Shor's theorem, you can come back down the y-axis and become quantum coherent again. Perhaps more surprisingly is we decided we wanted an x-axis. So here's the x-axis is order criticality, and chaos. I wanted it because, as, as Anton told you years ago, I was looking at random Boolean nets, and they show order, criticality, and chaos. This is, I thought, we've got to have order and criticality and chaos. And the next day, I met Gabor, and I said, I, I, I want it. He said, it's, we've got it. So in classical physics, new graph. Here is order, criticality, and chaos. And here is what's called the Lyapunov exponent. Take two nearby points in a classical phase space that are on trajectories. If the trajectories spread apart, the system is chaotic, and it's got a positive Lyapunov exponent. If they come together, it's negative, and if they stay the same distance apart, the Lyapunov exponent is zero. So you kind of already know this. If you take a pendulum and start it at some amplitude, it'll oscillate. Galileo did this. If you put it in addition, addition, a different initial condition, it'll oscillate just as well with the same period. So if you look in position displacement, position velocity space, you get a circle and you get concentric circles. The concentric circles stay the same distance apart. So theorem, if you change the Hamiltonian of the system from a pendulum, to funny looking ones, the Lyapunov exponent stays zero, then it kinks upward like that. That's a second order phase transition at criticality. So classically, it's real. Gabor and I wondered, if you've got this excess on the y axis, might there be a quantum analog of criticality? It turns out the answer is yes. And it's really exciting. Um, then it's going to turn out, as I'll show you in a minute, we can measure molecules and ask, are you ordered, critical, or chaotic? Uh, so in quantum, in the quantum world, uh, there's something called Anderson localization. So you can have a, a surface, an energy surface, with bumps on it. Phil Anderson got the Nobel Prize for showing that if the bumps are high enough, the quantum wave function will get trapped on the bumps, and it's called localized. And it corresponds to an insulator, not a conductor. If you lower the energy bumps enough, the wave function spreads out, out over, for example, the surface, and it's a conductor. Quantum criticality is right between conducting and insulating. It's called the metal-insulator transition. 
and it corresponds to very strange wave functions that are fractal. Okay, it's the wave function in effect spreads out locally in space, but doesn't go everywhere, and it, it's established. Hold that, because now I'm going to tell you something that it, I'm on the paper but into the work. Uh, Gabor Vate at Utfish, Dennis Salahab at the University of Calgary did the following experiment. You can ask of a single kind of molecule, methane, are you ordered, critical, or chaotic? Roughly, here's how you do it. You all know that molecules have absorption lines. So take a molecule that's got a few hundred absorption lines and measure for every absorption line the energy difference to the next higher absorption line. Now plot on one axis uh, how far apart the energies are. You might get a lot of, uh, of adjacent absorption lines that are close together, or they might be far apart. So th that makes sense, okay? So you get three curves. One is a distribution where here's the energy difference between adjacent bands, and here's how many at that distance, and it's exponential. It drops off that way. That is order. Using random matrix theory, which I kind of understand, you get a unimodal distribution like that. That's chaos, and it's conducting. There's a unique distribution where this peak is shifted in a little bit towards the this, this side, which is critical. Gabor and, 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 and Dennis have now measured about a thousand evolved organic molecules with stunning result. Half are ordered, and half are critical, and a few are chaotic. Why are half the molecules critical? It's one point on the x-axis at the metal insulator transition. Well, there's sort of two broad possibilities. If you took organic molecules from the Murchison meteorite that was formed five billion years ago, it might be the case that half of them are ordered and critical, or not. Suppose not. Then why are biological molecules critical and ordered? It must be good for something. Nobody knows quite what. Okay. Now, um, so that's the x and y axis. So both the x axis is real, experimentally, and the y-axis is real. I think life is substantially in the poise realm. We are not finding that a number of proteins are quantum critical. Um, and there's some evidence that they're conducting Cooper pairs, showing superconductivity. Don't believe that yet. Stuart Lindsay is doing the experiments, and it might be true. OK, so, so that's the poise realm. Uh, so I want 21. Uh, that's 21. Uh, no, I, now what I want to do is I want to try to answer Descartes. Decoherence is not causal. It's just the loss of phase information. So imagine uh, a surface that if it's decoherent, it's gray, and if it's coherent, it's pink. I can picture that. And imagine that pink regions change to gray and gray regions change to pink. Decoherence is a way that a quantum and poised rail mind can have a causal consequences for the classical meat of the brain. So our problem with the stalemate is Descartes says uh, raise, raise cogitan and raise, raise cogitan and raise extensa. We have no causal way that mind can operate on brain, and we've been stuck there since 16 to 40. If mind is partially quantum, it can have a causal consequences for the brain by decoherence. And we've answered Descartes. That's it. Decoherence gives you the classical world for all practical purposes. And it can do it over and over and over again because pink can become gray, can become pink, become gray. And I think there's a good chance something like that is right. The light harvesting molecule is showing decoherence and recoherence. It's true for the light harvesting molecule. Maybe it's true for the brain. Of course, we don't know that yet. So I think this is truly a proposed answer to Descartes 350 years later. And that's how I like it. Okay? I think there's a reasonable chance that it's true. Furthermore, I think we can find out. So let me now talk about this. How would we show that the brain is doing something quantum? Well, a lot of people think about it. But here's, here's one way. I used to do fruit flight genetics. So you could take a fruit fly, you can give it ether, we're OK. You can give it ether, and it's anesthetized. And 
unless you're nuts, he just goes to sleep and falls over and awakes up about 15 minutes later. It is a standard genetic experiment to do the following thing. Take normal flies, they're called wild type. Expose them to a low dose of ether for some duration and <clears throat> uh, some of them will not fall over for quite a while. Take the ones that are resistant to ether, breed them, and keep selecting on flies. No, I've done it the wrong way. I want them to fall over very easily. I want them to be easily anesthetized. So just select on a population of flies so that with a tiny dose of ether for a microsecond, they're anesthetized. So I've got wild type flies, and I've got easily anesthetized flies. Now, if, if it's true that quantum mechanics has something to do with consciousness, then we can ask the following question. Is it straightforward to sequence the genome of the wild type with the selected flies? It's trivial, right? We all know how to do it. Can we identify that there are seven mutant genes? Sure, or 23 or whatever it is. It might be RNA that doesn't code for a protein, but right now, imagine that it's a protein that's been coded for. Can we find out where that protein is? Sure. Just label it and find out where it is, right? Use green fluorescent protein and find out where the protein is in the organism. Maybe it's in synapses. Maybe it's in the, maybe it's in the leg of the fly. I have no idea where it is. Can we answer the question? Yes. So if we saw that, we'd say, gee, there's something going on here that has to do with these proteins that has to do with consciousness or un not consciousness. Maybe it's correlated with the experiment. How would we know that there's some quantum behavior of the wild type protein that is not carried out by the mutant protein? In principle, that's an askable question. We want to ask, is there a quantum behavior that the wild type protein does that the mutant doesn't? And I have one candidate to look at. Suppose Stuart Lindsay is right. These proteins are quantum critical and they are conducting, uh, they're conducting coup repairs, they're superconducting. I don't know if that's true, but it's an example. We can ask, is the wild type protein critical and is it conducting uh, coup repairs? And the mutant protein is not. Well, we could get that evidence. If we saw that a few dozen times or a few thousand times, we begin to believe it. I don't yet. The point here is that this is not just philosophy, although it is, it's testable. So where are we now? Okay, I want to end up with the following. Let's see how we're doing. I got about five more minutes, maybe? Oh, R20, okay. Um, so I want to make the same move now that Eugene Wigner did, maybe 50 years ago. Um, in quantum mechanics, there's all kinds of suggestions that consciousness has something to do with measurement. Von Neumann says that in his 1933 magnum opus. He, he wants to claim that consciousness is a sufficient condition for measurement. All physicists want to say that an apparatus measures as well. Right now, it's enough for me if consciousness is a sufficient condition for measurement. Wigner makes the hypothesis that I make 50 years later, measurement is somehow associated with consciousness. I don't know that, um, but it might be. Uh, so I guess I've got a couple more slides. I'm going to tell you an experiment whose results are astonishing, but you should not believe them yet, 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 yet. Probably it won't hold up, but it might. There's a very interesting man named Dean Radin. In, in the Bay Area. Here's the experiment. You take the two-slit experiment and you ask somebody to sit next to it and to try on purpose to alter the intensity of adjacent light and dark bands. If true, this is psychokinesis. It's mind affecting matter by affecting the Born rule. The outcome of a, a measurement is the, the square of the amplitude. Dean Radin says he has very weak results but the probability of getting it is one in a hundred million. I don't believe it, but suppose it were repeated about a thousand times, would we believe it? Yeah, at some point we might believe it. Um, Dean also finds that the person can be on another continent and he gets the effect. So that's getting really impressive. Do I believe that? No. Is it a doable experiment? Of course it's a doable experiment. Should we believe it? Of course not. Dean is now being repeated for the first time by a group in Brazil. I hope they find it, but, but I'm not confident of it. 
Meanwhile, I haven't told you non-locality. This is Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen in 1935, I guess. And they're trying to show the incompleteness of quantum mechanics. And they say, you know, if you've got two entangled electrons, and they're two million miles apart, and you measure one and it turns out to be spin down, instantaneously, the other one is spin up. But light can't travel that fast. So Einstein says this is spooky action at a distance, therefore quantum mechanics is incomplete. I mean, he spent his life trying to show that quantum mechanics didn't work, although he got the Nobel Prize for the photoelectric effect. The experiments did not been done since the mid-1950s by Alan Aspect and many, many others. It's called non-locality. Non-locality is true. Nobody knows what's going on, but non-locality is true of the real universe. It's non-local. So that led me to ask Dean Radin, what if the person were sitting on Mars and you got the same result in San Francisco? He said, that's far enough apart that it's non-local. Is that a doable experiment? Sure, all we've got to do is go to Mars. That'll happen in the next 50 years. Suppose that was done a few thousand times and we believed it. I don't, but it might. Then mine must be quantum mechanical because it's not local. So, does this t so let's suppose that that were true. I don't remotely suppose it. But I want you to notice that this isn't just silly. It's a perfectly doable set of experiments if done incredibly responsibly. Remembering that extraordinary claims take extraordinary evidence, and that's certainly not here. <coughs> so, <coughs> that's point 25. Uh, oh, I, I already told you 26. Uh, I won't tell you 27, and I won't tell you 28 unless you ask about it. It's neat. So, let me summarize. The stalemate, the problem with Descartes is that there's nothing for mind to do and no way to do it. And if you think that mind and body must be classical physics, you can't answer Descartes. You have an epiphenomenal mind. A classical brain could perfectly well be conscious, but it can't change the world. It's an epiphenomenal mind. And that's fine. I mean, maybe that's what we are, and many people think that. We're not frozen into that. Quantum biology is real. Why not think about quantum mechanics? In fact, nobody knows what the classical world is. So why not take quantum mechanics seriously? It allows counterfactual claims. So the present can have been different or could have been different. And it's non-deterministic. It allows free will. It's a struggle to get a responsible free will. There's ways to try to do that. It's not stupid to think that, quant that, that consciousness has something to do with measurement. Raiden may be testing that. It's not stupid to think that measurement has something to do with consciousness. In principle, one can test that by the, the fruit fly experiment. I think my own feeling about this is something like very cautious optimism. I, don't, I think that what I've said is logically coherent. I think that's fine. That's not the problem. The problem is we don't have the data. Could we get the data? Yeah. Well, hold up. I don't know whatsoever. So maybe I'll just sort of stop there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for thank you for putting it in my voice. I, I want to prove I'm really here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, sir. So